This video is designed to teach you about two important variables, the beta and the sharp ratio. The first is a measure of risk for financial assets, especially stocks, and the second is a measure of risk-adjusted performance for all financial assets and for portfolios of financial assets and for investment strategies. This is an introductory video that just barely introduces you to the concept. But you're likely to encounter these on financial websites like Yahoo Finance or Google Finance, especially the beta, when looking at the performance of stocks in their key statistics. So you should at least understand what they are supposed to represent. In financial modeling theory, Risk can be represented many ways, but one of the most common ways is to take the yield of the asset in question or the growth rate of the capital gain of the asset in question, if it's a stock especially, and represent it as a distribution about a mean. Now you ask the question, distribution of exactly what? Well, typically, again, it's going to be, in the case of stocks, a distribution about the growth rate of the capital gain in the price of the stock. This is typically assumed, at least initially, to have a normal distribution or a so-called Gaussian distribution, and that can be tested to some degree of fit. And if the test is survived, then you can calculate the standard measures of dispersion for this asset, in particular the variance and the standard deviation and it is very common to represent the standard deviation as your first proxy for risk. But again, this still begs the question, exactly what variable are we converting to a normal distribution? Now this slide assumes that you know what a natural log is. If you don't, then there's going to be some part of this that you don't understand, or you'll have to go look up and see what a natural log is. But if you have time series data, such as represented on the right, the daily observations for the price of stock for, say, Cisco, where some of that data set is shown, then the continuous growth rate daily is equal to the natural log of the price today divided by the price yesterday, or price at times t divided by price at times t minus 1. So in looking at this example, we can see that the first observation historically for the data set that we have, which may be the 250 annual daily observations for a given year, given that the markets aren't open on the weekend, the first continuous daily growth rate represented here as 0.0230 is going to be equal to the natural log of 22.86 divided by 22.34. And that is the variable that we're referring to as our daily growth rate in Cisco. And that is the value that we believe to be or test to be distributed across the normal distribution. This allows us, of course, to compare stocks of widely different prices. You may take a look at Apple, valued more than $100, Cisco, valued less than $25. What really matters is not those prices, but how much those prices are changing on a daily basis, and this statistic is our introduction to that change. Now, once we have that data converted, in Excel or MATLAB or in a computer program that we design, then we can calculate these three observations. The top is the estimated historical growth rate of the stock. That's a simple formula up there for average, taking all of the observations and summing them and dividing them by the sample size. The first measure of dispersion that we can calculate is the traditional store, uh, formula for variance where we take each observation and subtract the mean calculated from the, uh, the top formula, squaring that and dividing by the sample size, and that's our variance. And then finally, by definition, standard deviation, which is our first 
primary proxy for risk is equal to the square root of that variance. In my work, I typically stop there. I typically regard the standard deviation of a financial asset or the price movement of a financial asset like a stock to be the proxy of risk that I'm going to be using. Markets, however, want to put this risk estimator in context. And to do that, they want to compare your stock, in our example Cisco, with some other metric like the S&P 500. And that is what is being represented here. There are two applications for beta that are fairly common. One is to compare the price of any stock to the S&P 500. The other is to compare the price of a stock to a portfolio to which you're considering adding the stock. This example shows the calculation of the beta for a stock compared to the S&P 500. In this, the beta is equal to the covariance of the stock and the index divided by the variance of the index. And again, in both cases, we're using growth rates for the stock and for the S&P 500 that typically are continuous growth rates as discussed earlier. The covariance itself, the numerator, is equal to the correlation coefficient of the two stocks, which is a common statistical metric, times the products of the standard deviations. So specifically, in the context of a stock being compared to the S&P 500, the covariance is equal to the correlation coefficient between the stock and the S&P 500 times the standard deviation for the stock times the standard deviation for the S&P 500. The correlation coefficient is a statistical measure of the actual correlation between the stock and the index, and it will typically be between 0 and 1, where if it's 0, that implies complete independence and no time series correlation at all, whereas if it's one, the two are perfectly correlated. It's also possible, of course, for the correlation, cor correlation coefficient to be negative because it is possible on any given day when the S&P 500 goes up for a stock like tilt, for example, which may be inversely related to go down. So if it's negative, that would imply an inverse relationship between an index and any given stock. Then in the beta, this numerator is divided by the variance of the S&P 500 in question. Now here's an example that I have always used for years of a very high risk, high beta, high loss stock. Loss at least as a potential. You can see this is a stock that appears to be a biotech, and that's what it is. It's Dendrion. And this stock lives or dies by, or lived or died, actually this is an historical example, by their success in uh, trials for the drug Provence, which they manufactured. The beta for this stock in 2012, when I drew, first drew up this graph, was an astonishing, remarkably high 5.29 compared to 0 0.62 for ExxonMobil in 2012. By uh, fall of 2014, the beta had fallen to 2.89. The stock had stabilized some. But a beta of above 1 implies that this stock is much more volatile, or is more volatile than the S&P 500. 5, of course, means much more volatile. 0 0.62 implies that ExxonMobil is far less volatile than the S&P 500. These, in fact, are the beta rules of thumb. If the beta is greater than 1, and if you're comparing the stock to an index, then the asset is more volatile than the index. If you're comparing the stock to the standard deviation of a portfolio to which you're considering adding the stock, then if the beta is greater than 1, the portfolio would be more volatile. It might offer a higher gain, but it would be more volatile. If the beta is less than zero and greater than one, then the asset is less volatile than the index if you're comparing it to an index. And if the asset is added to the portfolio, then the portfolio would be less volatile. And if beta is negative, which implies negative correlation, 
the financial asset in question moves in the opposite direction of the index or would move in the opposite direction of the portfolio. The second variable, the Sharpe ratio, is fairly elementary. In the numerator, the mu is our estimate for the rate of return of the stock as measured in capital gains. Typically, this is going to be the historical estimate that we referred to earlier, although it could be a subjective estimate by an analyst of how this is going to do in the future. The denominator is our very elementary risk measure, the standard deviation of the historical series of the stock as measured typically by its daily growth rate. There's another variation of this that subtracts the risk-free interest rate from the yield, a practice I don't bother with because it really doesn't add additional information. The Sharpe ratio is often used in the context of evaluating a portfolio or an investment strategy because clearly you want to get the highest Sharpe ratio you possibly can in building a strategy or a portfolio. You want the numerator to be the largest number it can be relative to the size of the denominator. And so when comparing strategies, for example, backtesting, you compare the Sharpe ratio in backtesting of two or three different strategies. So that concludes our discussion of these two variables. You can find material that is offered at Econ 136 that has a lot more detail and background about the origin of the use of continuous growth weights, for example, and how there are various variations on this theme. I should warn you that sometimes the betas that are in the newspaper or in the media are much more crudely calculated than what we've done here, and sometimes not calculated correctly. So this concludes your introduction to the beta and the Sharpe ratio.